Shalom from Israel to all of the Daystar viewers around the world. I'm Moshe Bartzvi, the producer and founder of Israel Now News. We at Israel Now News are dedicated to bringing you the full story and the truth about Israel from Israel. It's written in the Holy Bible when David said in Psalm 25:5, Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. And God says in Zechariah 8:16, These are the things that you shall do. Speak out the truth to one another. Judge with truth and judgment to peace in your gates. And always search for the truth, and the truth shall set you free. John 8:31. I hope you enjoyed the program. God bless you from Jerusalem. Shalom, shalom. Welcome to Israel Now News. I'm Yochanan El Rome. And I'm Erin Viner. In our top story, the European Union has voted to ban its member states from signing any contracts with Israeli businesses who operate in Judea, Samaria, and parts of Jerusalem. This rule forbids any cooperation, awarding of grants, prizes, and funding for any Israeli entity operating in those areas. The resolution also says that any member state which makes a contract with Israel must include a clause stating that Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria are not part of Israel. But just as a body cannot survive without its heart or its soul, Israel cannot be separated from Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. Israeli leaders responded that the decision was racist and that the European Union was acting unfairly. Housing Minister Uri Ariel said, this decision is tainted by racism and discrimination against the Jewish people, which is reminiscent of the bans against Jews in Europe more than seven decades ago. A group of U.S. congressional representatives sent a letter to European Union Foreign Policy Chief Catherine Ashton expressing their disagreement with the EU's ban on Israeli settlements. Leaders of the bipartisan Congressional Israel Allies Caucus wrote that they strongly believe the move is counterproductive to sincere American efforts to restart peace talks and that the new European guidelines will only serve as a disincentive for the Palestinian Authority to engage in serious final status negotiations. The group said that it encourages the European Union to reconsider the decision, saying that it is their belief that a sustainable framework for peace can only be decided through direct negotiations between Israeli and Palestinian leadership and that the cause of peace cannot be advanced by the EU, placing blame for the lack of progress solely on Israel. Israel has agreed to free 82 Palestinian terrorists as a goodwill gesture and is considering releasing more as an incentive for the Palestinians to return to negotiations. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry personally delivered the list of prisoners that Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas is demanding. That list includes violent murderers who have been imprisoned since before the Oslo Accords. The list includes Mahmoud Abu Harbish, who was found guilty of throwing firebombs at a bus which killed David Dolorosa and Rachel Weiss and her three young children. The PA is also demanding the release of Mahmoud Issa, a Hamas member who kidnapped and killed an Israeli border guard in cold blood and ran down two Israeli soldiers with his car. A group of terror victims' families have been petitioning the Israeli government against the release of the convicted murderers. One of the bereaved family members said, We supported the release of my father's murderer in order to win the freedom of Sergeant Gilad Shalit because the life of an IDF soldier was on the line. But demands to free these terrorists now is without any purpose, since pardoning terrorists with blood on their hands completely contradicts the desire for peace. You can't make peace with murderers. 18,000 people have signed a petition in the last week against the release of Palestinian terrorists, and that number is expected to skyrocket. As major concessions are now under consideration in preparation of renewing negotiations with the Palestinians, members of Israel's cabinet are expressing skepticism over the ability of PA President Mahmoud Abbas to negotiate on behalf of the Palestinian people. Leaders of the Hamas terror organization, who rule over 1.5 million Palestinian residents in the enclave, say that Abbas is not authorized to represent them, and even factions within Abbas' own Fatah party have expressed their opposition. 
According to Israeli cabinet member Israel Katz, Abbas has less control over the Palestinians than Syria's President Bashar al-Assad has over his divided nation. And just as no one would seriously consider a land transfer to Assad, it is impossible to seriously contemplate transferring control of any territory to the Palestinians. Former Foreign Minister Avigdor Lieberman noted that it is unclear if the Abbas government in Judea and Samaria is even legally legitimate since elections that were meant to take place over three years ago have been repeatedly postponed and that it's clear that Abbas is unable to sign an agreement that will end the conflict. The Taliban has been exposed. The Islamic terror group tricks young children into becoming suicide bombers. Britain's Channel 4 television has revealed disturbing tactics used by the Taliban in Afghanistan to recruit children as young as eight years old. According to Britain's Daily Mail newspaper, Taliban terrorists bribe starving children with candy if they will set roadside bombs, act as decoys in deadly ambushes, and even become suicide bombers. The heartbreaking report exposes that young children are deceived by these Islamic terrorists into becoming martyrs. French Muslims stage violent riots outside of Paris, sparked by the arrest of a Muslim man who assaulted police who ticketed his wife for wearing a full burqa in public, which is contrary to French law. The suspect grabbed the throat of the ticketing officer and attempted to strangle him. In the aftermath of that arrest, more than 250 angry Muslims took to the streets, damaging a police station, burning garbage bins, and shattering the glass at bus stops. More than 20 cars were burned the following day, also outside of Paris. A New York politician has found Saudi Airlines to be in violation of U.S. law for refusing to sell tickets to Israelis. New York City public advocate Bill de Blasio conducted his own investigation after hearing that Israelis were prohibited from booking tickets on Saudi Air's website. He called the airline claiming to be an Israeli citizen and was denied a ticket by Saudi Airlines staff. De Blasio said Saudi Airlines is in violation of U.S. law, which stipulates that an airline which operates in the United States cannot discriminate based on race, color, national origin, sex, or ancestry. He said Saudi air policy is illegal. De Blasio sent a letter to the director of Saudi Arabian Airlines saying that if they do not change their discriminatory practice toward Israelis, his organization will act to make sure that Saudi Air is excluded from the United States airports, starting with JFK in New York. A Norwegian woman sentenced to 16 months in prison for being raped in Dubai has been pardoned. 24-year-old Marta Debra Delev was brutally assaulted by a co-worker during a business trip to Dubai in March and arrested after reporting the crime to authorities on charges of committing adultery. In an attempt to preserve the image of the United Arab Emirates as a modern international metropolis, Dubai authorities pardoned and released Dalev, as well as her attacker. After forcefully removing its citizens from the Gaza Strip in 2005, Israel relinquished Gaza to the Palestinians. The Hamas terrorist organization moved into the enclave and used the territory's close proximity to Israel in order to fire rockets into the Jewish state. The Gaza Strip has become the most densely populated area in the world, and under Hamas control, most of the Palestinians live in squalor. The United Nations has released information about the poor condition of the area's polluted water aquifer. The terrorist rulers of Gaza have allowed sewage to seep into the aquifer. It's contaminated now. The UN estimates that by the year 2016, water from Gaza's only aquifer will be unusable, and by the year 2020, the damage will be irreversible. Despite the fanatical hatred that Gazans express for Israel, a few moderates have been working covertly with Israeli desalination experts to try and avert the looming crisis. The Palestinian Water Authority confirmed that Israeli experts have been training Gazans in water purification technology. The city of Jerusalem has hosted the largest Jewish sporting event to date. 9,000 athletes from 78 countries ascended on the Holy City last week to participate in the Maccabi Ah Games. About 40,000 tourists came to the capital for the event. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu greeted the athletes by saying, Year after year, Jews from around the world say, Next year in Jerusalem. But everyone who came to the 19th Maccabi Ah Games can now proudly say, 
this year in Jerusalem. Jewish athletes from 20 nations competed in the event for the first time, representing the Jewish communities of Cuba, Armenia, El Salvador, Nicaragua, and Mongolia in the city where their ancestors parted ways more than 4,000 years ago. That concludes the news portion of our show. Stay tuned for Ask the Source with Josh Reinstein. Hello and welcome to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein, and we're here in a beautiful day in Jerusalem on our rooftop studio. My guest today is Ronan Cheval founder and CEO of Intersu Organization. Ronan, thank you for being on the show. Thank you very much for your... Ronan, tell our viewers a little bit about what is Intersu. Intersu is a young adult organization which is based on universities and our main, our main focus is in advocacy for Israel in Israel. We have branches in 15 different universities, universities and we are trying to educate young adults mainly in Israel about why do we need to be Zionists, why to stay in Israel, why to fight in Israel. We can't take for granted things that used to be for granted, like young adults going to the army in the past or uh, uh, serv serving in the IDF and doing those kind of things, they are not uh, for granted anymore and we need to educate and give young adults the tools to understand what we are doing here. What are the main issues that you speak about on the university campuses? So I would say we are doing at least two things. The main thing is trying to, as I said, educate people for positive reasons for Zionism and to understand, to believe in the Zionist dream and to fulfill the Zionist dream. But in the other hand, we're trying to combat or give answer to the delegitimation process, which is trying to uh, create, to, um, I would say, uh, imagine Israel or try to give Israel the, the impression that it's not a, this is an apartheid state or it's not a legitimate state and trying to delegitimize and even dehumanize the, the Israel states. So we are trying to give answer to those uh, allegations against Israel. These allegations of Israel as an apartheid state, are these allegations happening in university cam campuses outside of Israel? Or are they even people in Israel who say these things as well? So this is the amazing thing. When one, of, one of the uh, terrible phenomena is that we see foreign money, mainly from other countries, going to a bunch of network of NGOs, of non-governmental organizations, who are advocating in Israel against Israel, you mean bearing us inside universities, as you have the Israeli apartheid week in North America, for example, we have the same phenomena here. Uh, we have the calling for the, the boycott, divestment and sanction movement. We have it here. Just one example, the head of the political department in Ben Gurion University, which is a very important university in the Negev, was, have signed a letter or have written a letter calling to boycott his own university. So we have problems of tons of money of, that coming from outside of Israel to some Israeli who are actually giving, they are the spirit of the attack against Israel. So we are trying to face this, this spirit uh, phenomenon. Th that makes absolutely no sense because you see across the world, outside of Israel, these anti-Israel apartheid campaigns. But in Israel, it's pretty obvious it's not an apartheid state. We are the only country in the Middle East which has rights for women, gender rights, religious freedoms. Uh, all our citizens are treated equally. So how can they even make that up if they're actually living in Israel and seeing it for themselves? Well, th that's a very good question, and I'm not think I, have, I don't think I'm not sure that we have a very very simple answer. I think that they are uh, too too complex. For decades, or more than decades, for hundreds of years, Jews have been uh, taking responsibility for everything that happened in the world. This is part of our ri rituals. Uh, we say Chatati Pashati when we pray. We are uh, when the Second Temple was destroyed, not because of the Roman. We take responsibility about it. So it became part of our political uh, political behavior of taking responsibility. Some uh, some people they they became they started to believe the anti-Semitic uh, allegation against against Jews during history, and because of this phenomena of. People are starting to believe the allegation against Jews. They were starting to ask themselves, okay, if Jews are not okay, how can I distinguish myself from this group? So, uh, um, and in order to distinguish themselves between the, uh, between the Jewish people, they started to attack Israel and th therefore trying to justify for themselves that they are not part of Israel. Was it clear? 
Uh, you know, these radical professors and revisionist historians that you talk about on the campuses in, in Israel, they must be the minority because, as I understand, the new young leadership coming out of Israel is fairly conservative and believes in Israel as the entire land of Israel and supports Judea and Samaria and, and the global Israel. Is that true? Is that a true understanding? That's, that's definitely true. But the problem is that those tiny uh, fragmentation of the society who are against the state of Israel, they, have, they are sitting in a key position, in, in key position in the academia, in key position in the newspapers, in key position in, in the media in general, in, in, this, in, in the court, in the law system. So, and then they, are, they have been able to create network of NGOs, and we are talking about dozens of NGOs with a, 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 a massive amount of money, which they ha have influence in the public discourse more than the majority of the society. This is how they can actually control the politically correct of the society and have a huge influence, which is uh, terrible on, on, on the state. So when, when they are in sitting in those key positions in universities, they can educate the next generation, or it's not only there. You have some newspapers who are really, really radical newspapers or, or, or phenomena which as I see it, and as many Israelis see it, putting the state of Israel in real danger. We, are, we have a huge threat not only from Iran, but also from Israelis who are trying to delegitimize the state from Israel from within. You know, there are literally tens of millions of people watching this show. What message do you have for our viewing audience? Well, I would say that don't take for granted that Israel is going to stay as a Zionist state. Because they are, there, is, there are so many attacks against Israel. So we need your help and we need your support in order to preserve the Zionist dream, in order to make sure that Israel is going to be the beautiful state that it can be. Thank you. Thank you, Ronan, for being on the show. And thank you for tuning in to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein. Now back to the studio. Those who dreamed about the Jewish state, those who wrought the historical miracle and against all odds established a state, those who arrived in the homeland to their new home, those who propelled Israel forward step after step. I have no doubt that this expanded partnership with our many Christian supporters will greatly strengthen Israel in the years ahead. And I want to thank you all for being part of that historic effort and that historic partnership. May God bless all of Israel's friends throughout the world. May God bless you. Up next, Shining Light from Israel. Every state has the right of self-defense and to secure borders to protect itself from hostile invasions and terror. Israel is a small state surrounded by Arab countries 650 times its size, some of which are large bases of global terror. Only 44 miles separate between the Jordan Valley and the Mediterranean Sea. After the Six-Day War in 1967, when Israel was attacked by four armies on three fronts, UN Security Council Resolution 242 stated that Israel was entitled to secure and recognized boundaries, effectively new defensible borders to replace the previous fragile lines from which it was attacked. What are Israel's defensible borders? What are its essential security needs? The Jordan Rift Valley Israel's eastern frontier forms a natural barrier between Israel and the countries of Jordan, Iraq, and Iran. The Jordan Valley rises from an area that is 1,200 feet below sea level to a hilly ridge of up to 3,000 feet, creating a steep 4,200-foot virtual wall opposite any force attacking from the east. The growing threat of global jihad activity near Israel's borders 
requires it to prevent infiltrations of terrorists and weapons. When Israel left the Philadelphia corridor in Gaza, it became a highway for the infiltration of terrorists and the flow of hundreds of tons of ammunition and weaponry from all over the Arab world, aimed at Israeli civilians. The Jordan Valley is the equivalent of Gaza's Philadelphia corridor in the West Bank. To defend itself, Israel must retain control over the Jordan Valley. This is Israel's mountain ridge, rising up to 3,000 feet. It dominates Israel's major coastal cities, where more than 70% of its population, 80% of its industry, and all of its airfields and seaports are located. Israel's only international airport, Ben Gurion, would be in the range of even primitive rockets, while all planes taking off and landing would be threatened by shoulder-launched anti-aircraft missiles. More advanced weaponry would be able to hit virtually any point in Israel. If Israel were forced back to the 1949 armistice lines, the Green Line, the country's width would be reduced to a narrow nine-mile waistline that would be impossible to defend. That's why any future arrangement must include Israeli control over key areas of the mountain ridge and Palestinian demilitarization. Israel's narrow borders means a combat aircraft can cross the entire country in under four minutes. In less than two minutes, an enemy plane could penetrate the country's airspace via the Jordan Valley and reach Jerusalem. In order to thwart an aerial attack on Jerusalem, a hostile plane must be shot down at least 10 miles east of the capital to prevent it from crashing into major population centers. Therefore, Israel must be able to identify hostile planes before they cross the Jordan River line and intercept them shortly after. To defend itself, Israel must control the airspace over the West Bank. There is enormous uncertainty about future trends in the Middle East. Iran is determined to become the supreme power as the U.S. withdraws from Iraq. No one can guarantee the future of many of the current regimes in the region. Today, more than ever, it is crucial to ensure defensible borders for Israel. Please stay tuned for the ICEJ report from the International Christian Embassy, Jerusalem. The annual Christian celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles presented by the ICEJ in Jerusalem is an event unlike any other. The feast is the largest and most popular annual Christian tourist event in Israel, with thousands of Christians coming from more than 100 nations with a common purpose, to worship the Lord, celebrate in His presence, and to bless the people of Israel. The feast is six days of dynamic worship, powerful teaching, prayer and intercession, and life-changing ministry. For 33 consecutive years, Christians have been coming to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, even during some of Israel's most difficult days. I will never, never forget when I was Minister of Tourism. It wasn't so nice like now. Terror attacks, buses, explosions, restaurants, empty hotels and everyone on the streets. You know, we took so much time. People closed their stores, closed their souvenirs, business. And all of a sudden, Feast of Tabernacles came. And thousands of Christians walking in the streets of Jerusalem and waving the flags of their nations.
I have seen the Lord work signs and wonders and miracles. I want to say to you tonight, like this little boy that's coming up here, if you've got the faith and the strength and the power to say, Lord, I'm putting my, my arrogance, my pride behind me, and I'm coming as this little boy, you will see the kingdom of God. My dear friend, God is no respecter of persons. He will use any man, any boy, any girl who says, Lord, I'll go. Let the rain come. Let the Holy Spirit blow upon us. Let Him fill us tonight from the tip of our toes to the top of our head. Come, Lord Jesus. They tell me it never rains here. Well, tonight is an exception. Maybe tomorrow the mountains will be full of green grass. Come on, let's give the Lord a clap, folks. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Wherever Jesus went, it was either a riot or a revival. Imagine thousands of believers from more than 100 nations in Jerusalem for the purpose of worshiping the God of Israel. Biblically, the Feast of Tabernacles was an appointed season for the people of Israel when God called them to have a sacred assembly and present themselves before Him. Perhaps this year in Jerusalem, at this feast, it could be an appointed time in your life, an opportunity for you to come to a new place in your walk with the Lord or to be empowered for your ministry. You may be asking yourself, I'd really like to go to the Feast of Tabernacles, but, but how do I get there? Well, here's one option. The ICEJ Feast Land Package is a great option to consider for those who have visited Israel or attended the feast in the past. The land package includes seven nights accommodation in a three-star hotel, full registration for the Feast of Tabernacles, bus transportation to the En Gedi Desert Celebration and to the communion service at the Garden Tomb. An optional tour extension to the Galilee is available for those who would like to spend a little extra time in the Holy Land. For more information about how you can attend the feast, visit feast.icej.org or email our feast registration team at feastreg at icej.org. That's all for this edition of Israel Now News. I'm Yochanan El Rome. And I'm Erin Viner, reporting from our studios in Jerusalem. Please join us again next week for all your Israel updates.